Cargill, 1999, the time and place where the Indian Army shed their blood so that we could live with our head held high. A soldier at 19, an officer at 21, a martyr at 22. He died at the age of innocence in the season of spring, when flowers bloom and love blossoms, when the freshness of youth gives life and energy and vitality that only adolescents can have. He was an ordinary boy, born of ordinary parents in an ordinary village, an average student fond of movies who grew up playing games in Mohalla playgrounds. He prayed with his family on festive occasions. He loved his parents. He had many friends. He was an ordinary boy, and yet he died an extraordinary death, a death of valor, a death of bravery, a fearless, gallant, heroic death. He died for his country, he died for his people, he died for you and me. His story is what legends are made of. The 20th of February 1999. The Prime Minister of India embarked on a momentous voyage a journey which would be long remembered as a defining moment in the history of the subcontinent. As this busload of goodwill raced down the Atari Vaga road towards the border, the distance between the two countries seemed to shrink. Atal Bihari Vajpayee carried the popular mandate of a peace-loving nation. शुभकामनाएं मेरे साथ हैं जो मुझे आज सीमा पार करते समय तथा अपनी पूरी यात्रा के दौरान प्रेरित करती रहेंगी। On the other side, Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif waited with his entire cabinet to welcome his neighbour. Even as the two prime ministers inspected the Pakistan military guard of honour. Few people noticed the absence of the Pakistan Chief of Army Staff, General Parvez Musharraf, who had stayed away, citing his preoccupation with a minor foreign delegation. But there was no doubt that Sharif's welcome was warm, as he quoted the poetry of Vajpayee to make a point for peace. Was Nawaz Sharif aware that his army had already initiated a massive infiltration exercise on the borders of India or not? is a question only history or Sharif can answer. The end of April 1999. While Vajpayee now heads a caretaker government in Delhi, the areas of Kargil are peaceful. Though at the receiving end of unprovoked and severe shelling in April and May 1998, during the holy month of Muharram, the predominantly Muslim population of Dras and Kargil are ready to receive six months of welcome summer. It is during this period that they trade, raise their crops and graze their sheep to meet the rigors of six months of cruel winter, during which the Zojila Pass is closed, snapping all road links to the rest of the country. Darchik, 
perhaps the only Aryan village in the world, celebrates the scents and smells of summer. The peace of this region is suddenly shattered on the 30th of April. The Indian Army has its first inkling of trouble. Indian air surveillance spots a Pakistan military helicopter carrying an underslung load. To military intelligence, this meant the chopper was not on a routine surveillance flight. A chopper with a large underbelly could only mean it was carrying substantial quantities of steel. Or worse, it could be carrying a large dismantled gun. Even as the army was absorbing this information, three shepherds were grazing their flocks on the slopes of a hill in the Banjo area in the Baitalik sector. They noticed a group of men dressed in black scurrying off behind some rocks. Knowing the faces to be unfamiliar, they attempted to follow, but were dissuaded by a burst of small arm fire. One of the shepherds raced down to report the incident to the bridge guard at the Garkund village. The guard immediately took him to Lieutenant Colonel Anil Pandey, who was the officiating commanding officer of the three Punjab station there. Early the next morning, Lieutenant Colonel Pandey sent out a patrol led by Captain Gore, with one junior commissioned officer and ten Javans, including two civil intelligence men of the 16 Grenadiers. The next day, on the 5th of May, Nayab Subedar Sulakhan Singh led another patrol which reconfirmed the sightings. I returned from my leave uh, from Leh on 3rd of May. And when I returned here, and I came to know that one of the patrols from my unit, led by a JCO named uh, Nayab Subedar Sulakhan Singh, he had gone out uh, just to confirm the presence of some unidentified people in the general area, uh, this Banju, which is behind this and then again further behind this, far away from here. When this patrol reported to me on 5th that there is some movement they have seen on the higher ridges of Kokarthang which is, cannot be seen from here, it's again further, if this height you take this, double the height of this. So then I, the patrol went out of communication. So I just said, Ki, okay, if it has gone out of the communication and since the movement has been spotted, then I as an officer will have to be going and then she also sent me there. Then we started climbing up, then I chose my own route and we kept going up, we came under the mortar fire that is indirect fire and the artillery fire of the enemy. As we climbed up on the ridge line that is leading to Kokarthang top, from there then I could see a lot of movement like some on the ridge line of the Kokarthang some people were moving in the black dresses and uh, some unidentified people, definitely not civilians and then on to the Khalubar side, then on to Munthudalo, I saw a lot of movement and then I kept passing with so and so strength I have seen. Plus, we are coming under fire. Alarm now started spreading to the other units in Dras and Baitalik. On the 7th of May, Colonel Oberoi of the 16 Grenadiers sent out a patrol led by Major Surve, which was ambushed. Another patrol led by Major Rohit Gaur of the 10 Garwal Rifles was also ambushed near the Jubar Ridge. As reinforcements were rushed in, the brigade commanders realized that these were not isolated intrusions. By now, enemy presence had been detected in Mashko and Kaksa, as well as Dras and Baitali. Corps Commander Lieutenant General Kishanpal, the senior army commander in charge of the entire Kashmir area, rushed back to Sirinagar from the bedside of his ailing wife in Pune to take personal charge of the operations. His first action was to move to Kargil to collate all available intelligence reports and plan a cohesive response. The initial strategy was to get in contact with the enemy and uh, contain him as also carry out an accurate assessment of the extent and magnitude of this intrusion. By about uh, 16th, 17th, the picture had started emerging. Prior to that, the way it unfolded, starting from 3rd May to 17th of May, it is not possible to assess as to what the magnitude would be. Uh, it is only once our troops gained contact and started reporting uh, uh, the presence of the enemy at various features, uh, starting from Turtuk subsector, going all the way to Mashko combined with the helicopter surveillance that a larger picture emerged. By 17th, it was quite clear that it was a massive operation 
which undoubtedly was supported by Pakistan Army. Because of its artillery support, it became clear uh, that it was an operation of a large magnitude, great extent and uh, full support, which would not be possible uh, to be planned, executed and sustained by the so-called Mujahideen. Uh, its very nature revealed that it is a Pakistani army operation. Kishanpal's boss, the GOC in chief, Northern Command, Lieutenant General Khanna, soon followed him, flying in from Udampur to monitor the situation. General Khanna decided to fly over the areas where intrusions had been reported. He got personal confirmation of enemy presence as his chopper was shot at by the intruders. Even as he returned safely to Sirinagar, the Indian Army ammunition dump in Kargil was blown up in cross-border shelling by Pakistan. The mood in Sirinagar was grim. Kishanpal realized that any effective response would require a massive troop movement through the Zojila Pass. Normally, Zojila Pass uh, is opened by about 15th of June. But uh, this year, because of the operational situation, uh, there was a necessity to open it early and we pressed into service extra effort to make sure uh, that this would not be a hindrance. And uh, this, as we learned later on, came as a big shock to Pakistanis because uh, they had not anticipated uh, that Zojila could be opened uh, this early. As the Zojila Pass opened, the Corps Commander started a massive build-up of troops. With new information coming in every few hours, the situation certainly looked very serious. Channels of communication were set up, intrusions were mapped out, with the army taking no chances as it moved to a war footing. Even as the 111 Gorkha and the 5 Para Commando were readying themselves for combat, Pakistan started a systematic bombing of the Sirinagar Leh Highway and adjacent towns and villages. Panic-stricken citizens started streaming out of their homes and abandoning their villages. As the houses of the district magistrate and the superintendent of police in Kargil were damaged in heavy shelling. The Kargil TV tower was blown up causing further demoralization. The Defence Minister arrived for a visit of the forward areas but was advised against going to Kargil. The situation was fast deteriorating as General Kishanpal moved the 8th Sikh into Dras to surround the base of Tiger Hill. Little did the brave Khalsa realise that they would remain at the base of Tiger Hill for the next 50 days before they would be able to conquer its heights. With just about two days of acclimatization and hardly any special clothing, my battalion was launched on 15th May to clear Tiger Hill 0 0.4460 and 0 0.4195. 0.4460 and 0.4195 were cleared by 17th morning. However, on 18th morning, when at, an, an attempt was made to clear Tiger Hill from southern slopes, where you see two small patches of snow, uh, the company came under very heavy fire. Another company that is uh, under Major Rathor was applied in area Pariyon Ka Talab. This is the Pariyon Ka Talab. As legend has it, banshees wail and dance on the frozen Talab on moonlit nights. Brave young Lieutenant Kannad Bhattacharya went missing in this area on the 17th of May while attempting an assault on the hill from the northwestern direction. He was not to return alive. His body would be only discovered after the snow had melted and the Indian tricolour had reappeared atop of Tiger Hill.
the village of Kaksar, surrounded by overpowering mountains. It was in these peaks and valleys on the 14th of May the desperate messages of the 4th Battalion of the Jat Regiment echoed, searching for a lost patrol. Earlier that day, Lieutenant Saurav Kalia had been sent out with an ill-fated six-member team to occupy Bajrang Post. The narrow valley which we see in front of us is the route which uh, Saurav Kalia took to the glacier areas on his way to Bajrang Post. Once the initial intrusions were detected in other areas, on the 14th of May, Lieutenant Saurabh Kalia was tasked to lead a patrol. The patrol started in the morning and uh, well after midday, we lost radio contact with the patrol. Uh, when Saurabh went missing and efforts to get in touch with him failed, then uh, Lieutenant Amit Bhardwaj was tasked to take out a patrol and locate Saurabh's missing patrol. Amit was immediate senior of Saurabh and as in the traditions in uh, battalions, he was the one who was tasked to educate the youngster on the norms of the army life and on the traditions of the battalion. Bhardwaj patrol, it was a very strong patrol, which had 30 strong bodies with it. And they had, they, the basic task was to contact uh, the patrol Saurabh, which was the first patrol that had gone. And uh, this was the one which was to sort of retrieve it. But then, it could not reach anywhere near to where Saurabh Kalia had taken his surveillance patrol. This is basically because then the Pakistanis, they, the enemy did know that now naturally since uh, uh, these people have been, let's say, fired upon or they have been captured or whatever it was, uh, they sort of were ready for you. So, a very heavy volume of fire from the direct and indirect firing weapons came onto this patrol which was known as patrol Birdie. Uh, this came under fire and they couldn't reach anywhere. The officer, Bhardwaj, was injured. He sustained two bullet injuries. He, along with one Havaldar, Rajbir, they both, you know, they took up position. Though injured, the first one, that is Bhardwaj, took up position, kept on firing at the enemy and told all the, ordered the patrol, you see, to extricate from there. And uh, these two, they kept on giving the covering fire. It was 62 days later when the territory was recaptured that the two mummified bodies were recovered close to Bajrang Post. Lieutenant Amit Bharadwaj was still holding his weapon in his hand. His finger pressing an empty trigger. The fate of Lieutenant Saurav Kalia and his men, however, came to light only on the 9th of June. Major Rahul Jain at post 42 was to receive the bodies of Lieutenant Saurav Kalia and his team. Well, this is where we live. And for a big guy like me, it becomes something like this. This place, there is no movement in the day for a simple reason. Both sides is waiting to take a pot shot. And uh, there is absolutely no movement in the day. We generally move at night. Being very close to the LC, my closest post starts at what, 20 meters. It is, and with the latest situation prevailing, both sides is waiting to take a shot at the other. So, Night is the best time to do all your jobs. They usually stick inside because we got snipers on both sides. And one shot is good enough to take a guy. Rest uh, living in this bunker because this bunker has got about uh, five and a half feet overhead, primarily to prevent any damage from RT fire or any of the heavy, heavier weapons. And, uh, over the time, one has got used to it. We were told that uh, they are handing over six bodies, that is, one left in Kalia and 
five others so they couldn't give us the names right but we had a hunch it is them i had gone to receive the bodies <coughs> when we got the bodies we first tried to identify them the first two bodies we could still make out what the face looked like the bodies had burnt marks the eyes had been gouged out in my hearts of hearts a soldier doesn't do all this at least a soldier cannot do all this if he's a soldier from the heart the saurav kalya's body had been shot through the face and actually the only way i could identify that body was because it had a gold chain around its neck that it happens to be an officer in fact the people who came to identify also were not very sure so i really can't put it into words how i felt during that time probably had the situation not been tense i would have cut his throat an avid student of birds Saurav Kalya's memory lingers on in the minds of his battalion of the Forge Art every time they look up at the sky to see a flock of birds flying away. In the next few days the Prime Minister, the Home Defence and Foreign Ministers were briefed by the Military Operations Directorate as the countdown to a formal conflict between India and Pakistan seemed inevitable. Indian Chief of Army Staff General Ved Prakash Malik toured the Dras Kargil Baitalik sectors on the 23rd of May. The next day he invited the Air Force Chief, Air Chief Marshal A.V. Tipness to join him at the Military Operations Directorate at the Army Headquarters in Delhi. The Indian Air Force now placed two fighter squadrons on high alert for possible strike operations along the line of control. The next day, the two chiefs briefed the Cabinet Committee on Security. Later that day, Air Chief Marshal Tipness travelled incognito to forward areas to prime the Indian Air Force strike base. On the 26th of May, the Prime Minister launched Operation Vijay. As dawn broke, MiG-23s, MiG-27s and Mi-17 helicopter gunships took off from airfields in Avantipur in Sirinagar. Flying 30 missions on the same day, Operation Safed Sagar, as the air operations were called, founded the base camps of the enemy in Indian territory, marking the start of a bloody 50-day war which would end with heavy casualties on both sides. A war which would make Kargil a household name in India. A war where the bravery of the Indian soldier would be etched in blood on those icy slopes for time immemorial.
With the launch of Operation Vijay on the 26th of May, the conflict between India and Pakistan in Kargil had developed into what the Indian Prime Minister described was a warlike situation. Though the Indian ground forces had been engaged in a fierce battle with the intruders of the Pakistan army for the last 15 days, the launch of Operation Safed Sagar by the Air Force added a very serious dimension to the conflict. The army had requested air support in the second week of May. When this help was sought, my first reaction was, hooray, at last. We are not warmongers, but we certainly have donned this uniform to fight wars when the occasion arises. Nearly 30 years had passed since the Indian Air Force had been used in operations other than casualty evacuation, logistic support and so forth, but no weapon had been fired in anger. However, the armed forces and the political leadership were aware that inducting air power can have fairly serious repercussions. When air power is used, escalation can be sudden and it can be to any dimension. To say that I will use air power to a limited extent does not mean the enemy would respond to the similar scale. The enemy could extend it to any extent, to an extent which it felt was necessary to meet its requirements. I think initially the army felt that you could contain the intrusions, because now it is well known that I think the extents of the crossing by the Pakistanis across the line of control was not fully appreciated in its initial stages. But when they found the going rough, I think jointly we concluded that we had to in fact use air power and use it the way that it needed to be used. And therefore you got the political clearance for it. Once government clearance was given on the 25th of May, the Air Force was rearing to go. The Air Chief toured the theater of operations incognito to activate his strike bases and prepare them to face any eventuality. I wanted to keep my movement as confidential as possible. In fact, I wanted to make sure that I went incognito. Whatever else it also achieved, the Chief's visit was really a morale booster to the young Air Officers. When one day my commanding officer came in, and he told uh, Pom, let's go for a briefing. And uh, I went with him. And uh, he took me, instead of the briefing hall, to a helicopter. The helicopter was started up. And I saw the air officer commanding of Srinagar driving down his vehicle. I saw a person uh, getting down from the gypsy, who looked very much like the chief of air staff. But uh, he was not wearing his rank badges neither was wearing any name tab, he was wearing a cap and I was not very sure. He looked like my chief but well, uh, chief never arrives like this. As the helicopter started, the one officer was standing uh, next to the cockpit. He told me chief of air staff wants you inside the cockpit and it was a shock for me. I went inside, chief told me to sit down next to him and he told me that I want you to show me the targets. I want you to assess because you are the boys who are going to fight. Till now I was hearing that well, Air Force might be called in. But now you're hearing from the horse's mouth. The very next day, air strikes were launched in Dras. We used MiG-21, MiG-23, MiG-27, MiG-29 aircraft and the Mi-17 helicopter in our offensive action. Initially, the targets were Tiger Hill, the Tololing feature and the Munto Dhalo area where a supply camp of the enemy was there. On 27th of May, one of the aircraft while carrying out the attacks, a MiG-27 aircraft flown by a flight left from Nachiketa, 
developed engine problems while in the battalic sector and he had to eject. Nachiketa's aircraft crashed into the mountains even as he ejected into enemy occupied Indian territory. And I saw about six to eight people running towards me from a northeasterly direction about a kilometer away. About 250 odd meters away I saw some huge rocks and boulders and I took the cover behind them. As I was recovering my breath, this was the time I realized somebody shouting in Hindi. Bahar aajao, aapke hi log hain, these kind of things. As I peeped behind from one of the uh, rocks, I could see about six men, all with uh, Pathan features. And they had formed a kind of a semicircle in front of me and they were rushing up the valley and they were firing. I presume they were firing AK-47s. The f closest uh, Pathan had come on top of me and he shoved the barrel of his uh, AK-47 into my mouth. 